Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. This is a really excellent conversation with our guest, Mario Tomek. Mario has grown a wildly successful coaching business. He, for instance, has a massive following on YouTube, but really the value in our conversation is not about amassing a huge social following. It's about investing time, money, energy, and patience while also leveraging people and technology to create the coaching business and the life you want. There are incredible nuggets of wisdom to be gleaned from this chat, so make time to listen to the whole darn thing when you're out on a leisure walk and be prepared to take lots of notes. We would love to have you screenshot your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at Health Coach Radio. The show notes for this episode and all previous episodes of Health Coach Radio can be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. Enrollment is now open for the fall semester of the Primal Health Coach Institute Level 2 Certification Course, an advanced coaching course that teaches you how to create transformational coach-client relationships, which, in our mind, is the best way to grow your coaching practice. So not only will you learn and practice advanced coaching skills, but this course also satisfies the educational requirements to enable you to sit for the NBC HWC credentialing exam so you can become a board certified health and wellness coach. Fun fact, PHCI has a 100% pass rate for the board exam. That means every single one of our graduates who've sat the board exam has passed it. Stay tuned to the end of the show to learn more or visit primalhealthcoach.com slash level two. With that brief sponsorship message out of the way, let's get into this exceptional conversation with our guest, Mario Tomek. All right, Mario, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I am super excited to talk to you about all things YouTube and fitness entrepreneurship. So if you wouldn't mind, Let's kick everything off with familiarizing our audience with who you are. Would you share a little bit of your origin story with us? Yeah, I really appreciate uh, you guys and for the invite to be here. Uh, Started very simple, discovered a passion for fitness, started a blog, uh, was a software engineer before this, so was not really meant to be a fitness model, walk around with abs, share half-naked pictures on the internet, but somehow I'm I'm today at that point in my journey, so it, it was a pretty interesting um, development in my own life. Uh, again, overweight, not really been into too much in sports. And, and that just was, wasn't me, but I discovered this is an identity in my mid twenties. And I really fell in love with it. I decided to switch the career, start coaching on the side. Eventually that turned into a business. Today, we serve hundreds of, uh, of clients all over the world. We, we specialize in an audience that's very busy, entrepreneurs, professionals. We do primarily coaching, so we've moved in that particular niche. I value a lot of that uh, personal connection, relate, building relationship, transparency, behavior change, psychology, really helping people make a lasting impact. And really, at the end of the day, for me, this whole thing is about seeing the direct result of my work. Because as a software engineer, I did see some of that, but it was pretty hard sometimes you know, you're stuck in a server. You just don't even know what impact you have. But this work that we do today with me and my team, we can really see that change happen in front of our eyes. And that's just been one of the most rewarding things about this whole thing, which got me hooked from day one. And obviously, it's been a while now. So we've developed our systems for almost a decade at this point. So really, really fortunate and grateful to be here. Ooh, almost a decade. So kind of like an early adopter in a manner of speaking. I mean, I know lots of folks who have been in the fitness industry for a long time. Fitness industry has been around for a long time, but the coach, I feel like the coaching industry getting into coaching probably 10 years ago, that was new. You're probably on the forefront. And now you're, you're talking about this in, in the context of we, so you have a team around you. So that took like 10 years time. And now you went from zero to having this team. Um, I want to dive into that trajectory or that pace a little bit. So take us back to when you first started, what did things look like when you first started your, your, your coaching mm-hmm. practice? That's a great question. So typically as we all get into something, I started this on the side. So I was doing software development, marketing, consulting. I was just 
thinking, well, let me start a blog on the side. Then a couple of people, of course, back in the day, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, blogs were the thing. Back in 2010, 2009, people were writing, people were reading, obviously not 2021, a lot less of that. But you know, I got some interest. I got to get some clients on the side. And that was all solopreneurship, quote unquote, for the first few years, because you don't really understand business. As a coach, when I started out, I wasn't thinking like an entrepreneur. I was simply thinking like a coach and you would get hired, you would write some programs, you get some support and that's it. But then the big shift was, for me was back in 2017, when I actually started seeing this as a business, 2016, 2017, I really started thinking of myself, okay, I'm running at capacity right now. And I'm not really able to help any more people, my audience is growing, I'm getting way more interest than I can actually serve. And my systems need to be better. I just need to scale. And the logical next step for me was thinking like an entrepreneur. Okay, how can I leverage certain things in my business to spend less time, how to hire more people, to be able to serve more clients, uh, certain things in the business itself. I realized that I was just very inefficient. So I didn't leverage technology enough. It just, I was brute forcing things to a point of burnout and not being able to keep up because if I, let's say I did daily videos for the entire year of 2016. So that, that's an example. You can check out YouTube channel. I can see day by day, I'm just posting videos. And that was great, but I was then dropping the ball on the inside with fulfillment. I was burning out on the other end and I was burning out in the side of things that other than the videos, you have a lot of other things in the business to manage. So I would totally neglect my email list, for example, or totally neglect this or that, because you simply can't juggle that many balls at the same time. So you have to start thinking, well, how can I do this? And that obviously inspired me to start hiring people. Hiring someone for the first time is a pretty big change coming from a sort of like a solopreneur to having a team. And then eventually it evolved, of course, today, really grateful to have a big team. And, and we're just having a lot of fun as well as being able to serve a lot of people. Oh my gosh, I love it. And and I know Aaron can relate to your story. I can relate to your story as far as having started out with a full-time gig and something completely unrelated, by the way, right? Aaron came from advertising. I came from finance. You came from software, totally unrelated. I started blogging around the same time, actually. Um, not because I thought I was going to start a side business. I was just pissed off, you know, at, at conventional wisdom and how it turned me wrong, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I think your story is going to resonate with a lot of people. And my role for the school that Aaron and I work for is as admissions director. And I talk to people every single day that are currently in an entirely separate field. Some are in a health-ish field in some capacity, but are looking to move out of that field into this. And the big question is, how do I do that? I have no idea how to do that. That seems so scary. And then I have to kind of put the brakes on and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not going to just leap into something brand new and hope it works. You've got to build a bridge to get there, right? Step by step, start something on the side. So um, would you mind a little bit? So you gave us a picture as to how you started from the blog and, and the, the at what point, you, so you talked a little bit about like, okay, so I'm at capacity. I've got to, what did that feel like? What was that like for you sort of emotionally and psychologically? And how did you prepare yourself to make that move? That's a great question. The burnout in 2016 was real. So I actually didn't have any other option at that point because there was no way for me to continue growing in terms of the brand and the content unless I'm going to do this stuff, unless I learn business. There was just no exit because I had to keep up. I mean, you you have the clients, you have to serve them, but you also have to continue building your audience because these algorithms are ruthless. I mean, if you stop doing, and I did stop doing content after that long burnout phase, and I did suffer for that because I just stopped pouring in. Internally, that was one of the hardest things that I had to do because I understood that, okay, I have to keep serving the audience. I have tens of thousands of subscribers here that they're expecting content, but I just can't keep up because I'm you know, struggling in my relationships not seeing my family, you got to put out a video every single day, which means that it has to be well-researched, edited, filmed, and that is just a whole life. So there's no life other than the video. So when people talk about how they're inspired by daily vloggers or you know these common trends on YouTube, they don't realize that if you're doing that, there's very little time for anything else yeah. in your life. There's very little time. You're consistently thinking about what's the next video going to be about, and you're not really improving much. And you eventually feel very depleted at the whole game. Like you start pouring out stuff, the quality can go down. You feel frustrated, and it can be seen in your daily emotional state through the videos. Not to mention, 
God forbid you get a cold or something, and then you have to do the video again. It's a very, very complex situation. The fear of also obviously hiring someone and trusting, that's a huge factor as well. Yeah. That, that trust element, because you got someone now that you re rely on. And when you're a solopreneur, yeah, you, you got everything under control. It's the same as kind of coaching yourself versus coaching other people. You know, you can do a lot of things, you know, I can discipline myself, do a lot of different things. But when you have a client, for example, and helping a client make a change and be adherent to a process is much more difficult. The same thing would apply in business. You know, there, there's that phase before you move into an efficient theme process. And then that's, a, that's the hard part. That's when a lot of mistakes happen. You're learning. I mean, a lot of those people, I'm, I'm no longer working with them because I sucked. I mean, I, I just be honest, like what, and I hired my first email manager. He ended up actually, I mean, we ended up having a good time together for a few months, but then I didn't know how to actually manage him correctly because he was bringing a lot of value to the company, but I didn't know how to get him to contribute even more because I was just a shitty manager at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So, so you got to learn how to also run an operation, which is a completely different skill set compared to learning about nutrition and exercise and all that other biomechanic stuff, which we as coaches love, but we don't like the other stuff and the admin work and the, and the sheets yeah. and the tracking and the data, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I bet you there's not too many people who get into health coaching that or health and fitness nutrition coaching that um, really look out to the future and think, man, someday I'm going to have to be a business manager. It just doesn't <laughs> even enter our minds. And so we get to that breaking point. It feels like a breaking point where it's like, I, I'm, I'm completely stuck here now. And the only way to break through this is to, well, you said, bring on some technology, systematize things, bring on people that, and that, but that's such a, that is such a difficult, that is such a difficult transitional phase. Mm -hmm. It's, and it's so wild because, and I, I heard you articulate this too. It's like, things were going pretty good. I was doing my little solopreneur thing. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, now I have to look at this as a business now because it's getting crazy. Um, I had a story when I hired my first helper and I hired, a, um, I hired somebody who had gone through my program and had great results, but didn't have the skills that I needed to help with. Um, so making those hiring mistakes, right? So Let's talk a little bit about, about how, like, how do you go about bringing people into the fold of your business now? I mean, you mentioned that you had a few growing pains with hiring people and some things did, it didn't work out a part of us because you didn't know how to manage people. My problem was I didn't know how to recruit people. I didn't know who to recruit. Mm -hmm. I was like, I just need somebody to help me. I didn't, I didn't take the time to set us like set up a, a job description. What do we need help with? Or what I also did was I said, well, I'll just bring somebody in to do some of my stuff and then I'll do some of my stuff and we'll just share my stuff without, <laughs> instead of being really specific about what I didn't want to do, what was a waste of my time. So can you take us through now that you're kind of a pro at this, what's the, what's the advice to hiring people? The way I see it, determining the role is 90% of the problem. So if I can just determine exactly what the role is, everything else is smooth sailing from there. And I think that's the hardest thing when you're a solopreneur. What exactly do I hire someone to help me with? Okay, a little bit of social media, maybe, maybe some posting. Should they create content? Should they just distribute content? Should they do this or that? What about the person that's editing your videos? Do they upload or just edit? Do they do this or that? What type of style? And it just you don't know how to define it. Then over time, you actually learn to define it. And I think this is what the majority of the focus should be initially. So if you just have clarity, you can also then have great expectations between you and your team, which also helps with managing the team over time. And, and I feel like at the end of the day, it boils down to relationships. You need to know what to expect from the other person and know what to expect from you. And if I'm defining the role, and obviously you want to leave some things for upgrading that role. So if someone mm -hmm. starts in, in your company, maybe as just your own assistant. I, I usually recommend this. So a lot of fitness coach come to me for advice and I usually recommend, look, get an assistant first and foremost, just someone who can help you out with some basic things just to get to learn things, but not risk your entire company on it, right? Just yeah. learn some basic things that someone can help you potentially follow up with some clients or post on social media or some basic role like that, that you can just learn how that actually works. And if you want to hire someone, you can start testing. Is it better to hire from your own client base? Is it better to hire someone who's a referral? Just from your own social media, you can always ask, especially of an audience. You wouldn't believe how many people just reach out, hey, I'm going to work for you for free. 
although I'm not the biggest fan of hiring people just reach out to you and cold email you, but no, it can be an interesting experiment. You can just have them do a trial project. Hey, write a couple of emails to me, see if it's, it's a fit or not. Could be also someone that you just simply go on Upwork and try it out because when you're hiring someone, you do a month trial, for example, you can really see what that feels like and looks like and where it's leading you and how much you're getting out of it everything in your business, how much it's changing. So I really am a big fan of kind of using that initial uh, baby stepping approach to get out of your comfort zone instead of what a lot of coaches would do. For example, they would, the you know, first day in the, they, they start realizing they need to hire, they, they get a business partner who takes you know, 50% of their entire business mm -hmm. suddenly overnight and they know quote unquote marketing. And then you just completely go out of the whole thing. And then you don't know that side of the business. I've seen a Great lot point. of that happen over the years. And instead of actually taking your time because some things do take time to learn. So I do I mean like when people are just a bit, bit more strategic about it, right? I know in and out every single thing in my business, not to a degree yeah. that some of my team members know, obviously they're specialized that they crush it at that, but I know pretty well. And I'm still in touch with the clients. I'm still in touch with every element of the business to a point as a, as an owner that I understand how it works. And then if mm -hmm. I'm hiring, I also understand what to hire for. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a big part that fitness coaches are missing. Like, how do you hire someone to manage your Facebook ads? If you have zero idea about Facebook ads, you're going to get scammed out of your mind for right. sure. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and one of the struggles I had with my hiring experiment, which, which I'll try again someday. Well, first of all, I'll say one of the great learnings I got from it was I ended up, we ended up parting ways. It just didn't work out because I didn't set it up properly. And then I took the time to write a job description, which was, I thought a really interesting experience. Um, exercise to go through because I'd never actually sat down and looked at my business from the perspective of like tasks and there's a lot of them holy moly didn't realize that um, but then what I struggle with and I'd love for you to speak to this is like relinquishing control mm -hmm. so for example you, for years you you researched shot and edited your own YouTube videos and then at some point you said I'm gonna I'm gonna relinquish control of let's say editing to somebody else was that hard because I can't even like it makes my <laughs> makes me it makes my breathing like I get a little it's like what if they don't do it the way I would do it like how how did you relinquish that control it's very difficult for me personally to to um to to even think in the beginning it was really difficult to think about doing that because I'm a perfectionist so for me personally when I see a typo when I see something not aligned correctly in the video I would just freak out and that mm -hmm. would, or someone publishes and sends out an email to my entire list and there's like a mistake in the email. Oh, oh my God. And that's the worst thing that can possibly happen. Oh. But then you, you kind of callous your mind over time when you realize, okay, that, that's to be expected. You know, some slip ups here, there. And honestly, people don't mind as much as I mind. You know, I noticed that my audience is very forgiving. So yeah, there's a mistake. So what, you know, the value is still there. So you kind of learn that. But at the same time, I, I think the greater point here is that there are so many tasks that you're not even aware of that are really taking up your time that you should be getting away mm -hmm. from that you're just mentally thinking about as well. So not just the fact that you have, let's say, posting on Instagram. It's a very simple thing. You can post on Instagram, doesn't take you too much time. And we say, okay, well, I'm not going to bother with hiring someone for that just because it's so simple. But when you add up, you know, 30 things like that throughout the week, you suddenly lost a lot of mental space, lots of momentum working on important things in your business. Instead of just got, let's say hiring someone who's a little assistant can help you with that. And you just don't have to think about it at all. The value of not thinking about it, quote unquote, at all. I say at all, quote unquote, because it's not completely delegated. You still have to follow mm -hmm. up from now to time, understand everything's going well, but the value of understanding, okay, that's taken care of and leaving that mental space to improve overall coaching systems, greater strategy, things that really, really matter, that you're the best person for that role, I think that's critical. People really underestimate the fact, just editing. Editing is not that complicated for me. I can edit a video in 30 minutes, not a big deal. But that's 30 minutes, right? And you might think, well, it's not a big deal like once, twice a week. But it is, it is because it's 30 minutes that I'm not just doing hardcore work for 30 minutes. I got to get into the zone of that 30 minutes. That breaks something else that I'm working on. And then that turns into two hours and then mm -hmm. publishing the same thing. It's so all these little things take much longer than we anticipate they will be. Right. And then that burns through your entire week because there's only so many hours in a week. I mean, 168 hours flies by if you're sleeping while training eating sometimes, you know, <laughs> doing things to take care of yourself and potentially having a life as well on the side of the business, you're going to run out of time and mm -hmm. mental space.
Mm-hmm. So um, I know coaches listening, we're going to have a nice segment of the population that are about where, like what we're talking about right now is kind of what they're thinking about. It's what's on their mind. This is where their business is at, but we're going to have a whole segment of people that aren't even there yet. Maybe they just got started. And um, one of the biggest areas of insecurity for people looking to follow this is how will I build it? How do I find clients? How will people find me? How do I use social media? What's the best platform? Now, I know you have a really large following. The YouTube seems to be your primary, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, But could you talk a little bit about the value that you find? Like why YouTube? Maybe how you might use that with other social media platforms. Like how did you build your following? Was it just organic growth? At some point, did you pay to grow that following? I I would love some Mm -hmm. talking points around that. We did try ads, uh, Facebook ads back in 2017, 2018. I've played around with that a lot. I haven't really found that to be the best fit for what we're looking for. So most, I mean, YouTube is purely organic. I've never ran YouTube ads. Um, for some reason, my Google ad account just got destroyed back in 2014. So I just never really got into it. I don't even know why. I just tried to run something back in the day and then just, they shut it down and never return it. So it's fine. No worries. So I built the whole you know YouTube channel without even relying and knowing that that's not possible. When I checked six, seven years later, I, okay, I can't run ads. That's cool. Not a big deal. I'm a big fan of organic. And the big thing for me personally, I think when you're just starting out, the huge advantage you have is intimacy. Uh, Because when you have a huge audience, it's hard to follow up. I mean, it really is hard to manage the lead flow. You have to have these systems that are now regulated by the technology or staff and, and whatnot. So it's not as intimate as you actually putting out something on Facebook, like a call out post, and just following up with everybody who commented and just chatting with them for half the day, because you have the time. And you have the energy, you're really starting out, you have the ability to do that. While someone who is at a stage in their business where they're getting overwhelmed with the amount of interest or just the amount of tasks they have to do, just much more difficult to do so. Obviously, you can again get a team to do that, but the intimacy of you personally doing it, it actually makes a big difference at the end of the day from a client's perspective. Plus, you can do a lot of things like that even for free, just putting yourself out there, building a name for yourself while someone with a business, I mean, you, you're kind of always thinking, well, where's my time better spent? Should I be creating a bunch of new lead magnets or should I actually service the clients that I already have who have already invested with me that I need to take care of and my time is better spent there? So you kind of have to reorganize your priorities a little bit here. I honestly think that for me, YouTube was a game changer because I went in a bit earlier back in 2014. I started dabbling with it 2015, 2016. I took really seriously the daily videos for a whole year, which took my following from around 3,000 to about 60,000, which was a really big change. So that at the time worked because I understood the algorithm, I understood what things need to be done, what things need to be said. And I added a, a very unique perspective on things because back before this, the whole evidence-based, science-based approach to fitness was not that popular on YouTube. Now, these days it is, there's much more of that happening, but it's about understanding the trends and where you are currently in the space. So if you're starting today, 2021, YouTube is still a great place, but the bar to break through on YouTube these days is it's much, much higher compared to back in 2015. Now, maybe Instagram is or TikTok or some other platforms and they all have their pros and cons. For me personally, the reason why I love YouTube is the evergreen component and the video library backend, which is sort mm-hmm. of like the legacy as well. Now, if you go in back in 2017, you'll see a video of mine that's still relevant to this day. Uh, one of the things that I personally don't enjoy, let's say with Instagram or some of the kind of course story-based content these days is just the shelf life type. It's just 10 seconds, 15 seconds is gone. People forget about it. I understand people like that type of content. And even YouTube is going in that direction with sort of this new shorts thing that they're putting out. I'm just a really big fan of going deeper with an audience. And I think that YouTube provides that level of connection with longer videos that some of the other platforms don't. And I've noticed mm-hmm. for me, when I have people reaching out for coaching and we, they're part of the program, when I talk to them, they watch a bunch of my videos. I really see that we have a great relationship already. They understand my core values. They understand what I stand for. They understand the philosophy behind this and just makes the coaching journey. It's almost like it already started back when it, they looked at the videos. So it's much easier now for them to be embedded in the whole coaching experience compared to someone 
watch the TikTok and then reached out. I might be wrong though. If someone is following like a thousand of your TikToks, I'm sure they have <laughs> enough exposure. Mm -hmm. But for me, YouTube, it's just been you know a handful of videos. People reach out, they say, okay, this is it. This is the person for me to talk to. And bam, they will become a client. Mm -hmm. It's been amazing for us. And at the end of the day, you can only be an expert at so many things. I'm not the best you know, TikTok, Snapchat person out there. So I just double down on what I'm really good at. And I do some of the rest of the stuff as well. I think a lot of people these days are going to go and follow someone like Gary Vee or someone who says like, be everywhere, do everything. I mean, yeah, sure. If you can do that, I personally, <laughs> I'm not able to keep up with all that stuff. So I'd rather pick one or two things that I'm really good at and I just do that. Yeah. You know, like as so, a side note, just real quick to follow up on that is again, in, in my role, I talk to people that are in the market for a health coaching. They want to get certified. And when I ask them, how did you find us? It's one of the first questions I ask, you know, what brought you here? How did you find us? I'm hearing more and more that they either found us directly on YouTube because we're starting to publish there now, or somebody else recommended us on YouTube. There's three or four coaches that are, their following on YouTube is really growing and they mention us and, and uh, recommend us. So it's become like a, like a total, like its own search engine really. And um, so I just, I'm really intrigued by it. And I do think for folks that aren't afraid of video, uh, fantastic. And if you are afraid of video, start practicing and get comfortable because to your point, I think the intimacy of somebody being able to watch you and hear you and see your face and your own tonality is a great way for people to get to know you mm -hmm. um, on what they might perceive as a more personal level. Just some thoughts mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I was going to kind of say is um, like video seems to be video in any form. First of all, seems to be where you need to be. Right. And, and whether it's a TikTok or a YouTube video, I guess that depends on you or your audience and whether they want that short, sort of cheap, mm -hmm. fast and easy content or, or the deeper, more curated content experience. I wonder, and I, I'm just thinking out loud, I feel like, I feel like something about our, our, our desire for connection that we're probably kind of really hungry for right now, just after a weird year if long form content is going to become popular again. Mm. Any thoughts on that? I think podcasting and YouTube, that definitely in, in my mind is that's what I consume as an entrepreneur. That, that is my number one uh, audiobooks, podcasts, YouTube. I can't remember last time. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, you, Instagram stories, things like that. I just don't, don't value as I mean, as much. It's almost like I, even if the, the information is gold, I just don't, I don't see how I would consume that because it's just fleeting. You got one idea, then after another idea, another idea, another, it's just flooding mm -hmm. you with ideas, but it's not going deep enough for you to really start thinking about it. When you're reading an audiobook, yeah, sure. An audiobook might be eight hours and you have two ideas in it, but there's a reason for those two ideas to take eight hours. There's different angles at it. There's different studies to back it up. There's giving you, it's giving you some space to think about it and you can internalize, you can try out, you can make it actionable. And I, I feel like that, for me personally, works well. I almost when I I'm getting hooked on this short cycle, these feedback loops that get you hooked on social media. I'm almost a little bit rebellious. I want my you know I want my attention back. I want to do what I want to do. Yes. And just moving into a long form piece of content, I've noticed also with my friends who are mostly entrepreneurs, they're really appreciative as well of going deeper. Kind of it feels like a conversation. They're just being a part of it. And no wonder, I mean, looking things like Joe Rogan's podcast, all these other bigger podcasts, they're, they're just getting really, really popular these days. And in my mind, if I was starting right now, it would be YouTube, as, as you guys mentioned, if you're comfortable with it, because that's the hardest thing for me as an introvert going on YouTube back in 2015. Oh, my God. <laughs> Even my English was broken. I mean, I'm not a native speaker. I learned English for a long time. But still, I mean, it was very difficult to get on a platform, talk about something it's all these super jack guys that are doing this for another five, six years. They look amazing. So you're going there and you're exposing yourself in a way that maybe blogging doesn't give you that much exposure physically. Right. They don't, they don't, you don't feel the same kind of nervousness in front of a camera. There's much more forgiveness with certain things like your audio being bad or someone messing things up. So you get really frustrated. With podcasting, I think it's sort of like a nice little middle ground where you still have that long form intimacy exchange of thought, but editing is a lot easier. 
I think the, the barrier of entry is a little bit easier than, than video on, on YouTube, although it's still pretty competitive these days. So I think that would be my choice of platform. Honestly, if I had to start over again, I, I would kind of do either YouTube or podcasting, maybe even more toward podcasting these days. Mm-hmm. And it's weird to say, although, I mean, I have a big following on YouTube and I'm kind of saying podcasting, but I just like the, the format. I like when I listen to a podcast, I feel like I already know some people, even though I never met them. It's just because I listened to them for such such a long time. So it, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I, I love the podcasting stuff. Okay. So, but here's the deal. Talk me through <laughs> this because <laughs> I, I started a podcast. Well, I have a landing page for a podcast. I don't have any episodes. And, that, and then when I walk around and I take my walks and I do my workouts, I'm listening to podcasts, devouring podcasts. Love it. I think to myself, everyone's already got this podcast is already out there. The podcast I want to make is already out there. What new thing am I going to bring to the podcast landscape? There are so many podcasts. Something like I heard some weird statistic that like something like 75% of podcasts that are out there in the world aren't even active anymore. There's like nobody's publishing episodes. It's like crazy. I, I'm, I just made that up. It's a staggering number of podcasts that are out there, but like dormant. Um, so how do you talk through, cause I know you work with, you work with fitness entrepreneurs as well. This is one of your, one of the things that you do. So if, if I'm a newbie fitness entrepreneur and I'm like, Oh, I want, I want to do a podcast, but what am I going to say? It's already, already out there. What would you, what would you pep talk me through on that one? every platform is going to have pretty much the same problem when, when you're just starting out. It's nobody knows you, you got no traffic, no audience. You're just basically starting from scratch. You, your mom and your dad, and maybe a bit of family is going to be your only following only people paying attention. And that's, that's okay. Because attention is not that easy to get these days. And you got to kind of think about that as well from a perspective of longevity in the business, because podcast is same as YouTube. It's not like you're going to make a video on YouTube and suddenly do something unique. What is unique? How do you break through that easily on a platform like YouTube? I mean, everything has been said a a billion times over and over and over again. And same thing as you mentioned, the podcast statistics of most of them not being listened to. So many dead YouTube channels, so many coaches that I know personally when I started back in 2015 that we were chatting, we were talking, we were putting out videos together. These days you look back, they they went back to their accounting jobs, being lawyers, studying back school, like just gave up. Now, a couple of them that survived, they made it really big and they committed to it. I think the expectations of making it within six months or a year oh gosh, should yes. be immediately demolished. I mean, mm-hmm. that that's just forget it. If, if you can't commit to this for a year, like crazy hardcore for at least a year, forget it. You're just not even going to make a single little dent. And even a year, honestly, like I did a year, nobody even knew me. Nobody knew that I existed on this planet. Now, oh my gosh, we're I talking, love that you, you know. said that. I love that you said that because <laughs> we have been saying that for so long where we get people that graduate and they're pissed off that they don't have, you know, clients within a certain amount of time. And at the end of the day, there's so many things about what they're doing that um, Aaron and I would go back to, well, who are you talking to? Who's your niche? What problem are you solving? Because I promise you, nobody's out there Googling health coaching. Like that's not a thing, right? So people are looking for a solution to their problem. And unless you are a well-known resource already, you're not going to instantly like grab headlines. You, so here's my theory. I said this a couple of times. I think it takes about three years to go from zero to a full-time career and able to leave whatever you, especially if you're doing this on the side. Okay. Might be a little different if you've got the luxury to just throw all caution to the wind and spend, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours a week on your own business in one year, or, or you have some other source of leverage or resource that allows you to get started faster. But for the typical person who's trying to build a business while holding down a job, and I don't know, maybe a family, and you're trying to transition into something totally new, that it takes like your first year, you learn a lot of lessons, you probably make some money, you get some clients that come in, you probably at least are breaking even, you could be profitable. But then, and then by your second year, you've learned a lot, you've refined your message, you've made twice the money that you made the year before. um, And now you've really, like something starts to click so that by the time you hit that third year, now things are gelling. Now things are really cooking. And that leap from finance, software, advertising, whatever it is, is a lot less risky and makes a lot more sense. That's my theory. What are your thoughts? 
there, there's something to that. I mean, uh, does it take three years? Does it take half a year? I think there, there are obviously individual differences based on how people are comfortable with certain platforms, how much content they can put out, mm -hmm. um, how much work they can actually do, how creative we all are. It's, it's totally different. How often you get into flow state, how often you don't, how's your psychology? Do you have any other life issues, life stressors coming in? Or do you have a safety net? Do you not have a safety net? How motivated you are? Like there's a, a million confounding factors. I always kind of keep in mind that there, there might be some survivorship bias here happening with, with my success and some of the other coaches' success that I know that have been in this for a while. Maybe we succeeded despite, you know, a lot of things that we did wrong just because we just kept persisting and it was the right timing and whatnot. Um, though, having said that, I, I did see, I mean, we see some massive success in helping coaches do this because I honestly don't think you need a, a huge audience to to do well. Now, obviously, if you want to be you know, running a seven figure business, you're not going to do that in six months. But can you replace your, you know, normal, normal income to to do that within six months? If you're extremely dedicated and if you're extremely coachable, I think you can. Now, if you're starting from scratch and you're not tech savvy at all and, and you don't want to work hard and you're looking for you know magic you know investment scheme with Bitcoin or something and you think this is the next thing, forget it. Like you're not gonna make it at all, like zero chance. But if you're extremely committed to building the business, putting out a, a, a ridiculous amount of content out there, just really starting to intimately reach out every single person that reaches out to you. If you have 10 podcast listeners, you know them by name, you know every single one of them, you know what they do, you talk to them a bunch of times, you add a ton of value to them, you're an actual expert, which I think is a big problem here that we're talking mm -hmm. about fitness coaching business today, but who is actually an expert? I mean, that's at the end of the day, another big that I think in, in this whole industry, like, do you know what you're talking about? Because Yes, you can get really, really good at marketing, but what's the substance there? Because one of the unique things that I think would separate some of my content or some of the other colleagues that do really well on YouTube is that it's a blend of, first off, your own personal knowledge and your own journey, which you've gone through a lot of stuff. You've done a bunch of certifications. You've worked with some people, even for free. Like I mm -hmm. have nothing against where I've worked with a ton of people for free when I first started out just to learn how things work. Yes, it's not the same as having a, a real client, but can you start helping other people, testing your skills, people reaching out to you? I think there's there's a lot of things that are happening in the make money online world that's now mm -hmm. starting to sift into the fitness coaching world that oh, yeah. you, know, you can make it big and, and quick using yeah. sort of the magic business model. And I just don't think that works that way. I, I do think if people have realistic expectations of replacing a decent income within six months, but not really doing it for the income, but really embracing the process and hustling their butt offs. And even if nothing happens, they're going to keep persisting. They're going to crush it. We've seen that in our you know, coaching programs, whether it's business or fitness, the same traits apply. And people that can run on, on pure belief for a period of time usually do extremely well. But people that are also willing to keep learning and innovating and iterating on their process, not keep the same thing up. I know a lot of people that have a YouTube channel for as long as I do, they have 500 people on there. Why do they do that? Why do I have 180,000? Well, when I see that something doesn't work, I change my ways. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I think that's one of the hardest things that prevents people from you know, succeeding in this industry is the fact that they keep doing the same thing, making the same mistakes, and then they're trying something new. And like, if you see that something is dramatically off, it's not like you're one feet from goal. Like you need a completely different approach to life and business if that's happening right now. So I, I feel like that's ultimately one of the things that you got to be adaptable rather than be super intelligent or super like it's all about adaptation over time. So if you mm -hmm. see that things aren't working on your social right now, your posts are not reaching anybody, nobody's responding. It's not that that method itself doesn't work. It's just the way you're trying to do it doesn't work. And mm -hmm. knowing that there's a better way, I think that that's important. And a belief that you can do it as well. I think that self-efficacy and that confidence plays a huge role in, in success. So you're talking about belief, and I think that's really cool. I was thinking about somebody who I know, and I'm not going to name her, but she's a recent student of our school. She just signed up. She's very early in the course, and she's out on Instagram putting out this content every day as though she has a huge following. Her energy, her attitude, the way she delivers it, her confidence. Um, nobody's watching. Like, there's just not, she doesn't have an audience yet, but she doesn't care. Right. She's not lying awake at night worrying that oh, I don't have a following. I don't even have a paying client. She's out there behaving as if she is already succeeding. And from my perspective, that's what I'm looking for. Like that's the attitude 
that is going to that's going to become something versus we do get the we do get some folks who are like, well, why isn't it working for me yet? Like maybe I should hire another business coach to scale my non-existent business to seven figures. <laughs> I, I just I really do think there's something to that idea of belief of really ha- uh, harnessing your beliefs. Absolutely. Embrace that, by the way, if you're right now starting out, you don't have any clients, don't say you have 500 clients waiting when you don't just embrace that be authentic that you don't have that you're just starting out, share your journey where you came from your story. And same as we already concluded as three of us here came from a totally different backgrounds, doing something we never thought we would be doing. I'm sure there's people listening to this that also have their own story. Maybe you came up as a teacher, and then suddenly you're doing this. Share that. That's unique. And what inspired you? All that stuff is amazing content. People want to know. There's thousands of other teachers that also want to do this as an example. So I, I think that authenticity is also the thing. I, I am sort of, you know, we're saying belief, but at the same time, you know, be very, very, very transparent with what exactly is happening in your journey. Understand, okay, there's no clients. Then you got to first two clients. Share their journeys. Mm-hmm. Share their journeys and on the on the process with you. I mean, I think that's what's lacking in this whole industry is that they might compare someone who's just starting out and then themselves and then compare someone who's super well ahead a couple of years. And they're looking at, well, I, I got to be like that person. And they start posting content that I would post to someone else. But that, that's just not applicable to you. Share what, what you're doing on right now in your business and your journey and keep moving forward. And you're going to get there to, to a point. I think there's a niche for that type of stuff. Really, really big niche, actually. People are sharing their own journeys, oh, yeah. doing weird challenges. This is what worked for me. And yeah, we come from a scientific background. We think everything has to be, I mean, I thought everything has to be referenced by a study and, and whatnot, which I think is great. And it, and it does help a lot with certain fundamentals, but and then they, there's a huge amount of anecdotal story-based content that crushes us out there. And if you actually think about it, most of the content that does extremely well is like that. It is just simply people sharing their experience. And there's everybody has a unique experience, unique story. So I do encourage people to share that and, and build a base of clients through that. Because if they are coming through resonating with that content, they're going to be amazing clients to work with. Like if you struggle with an eating disorder, you overcame it. You became qualified to help other people do that. Share that. Don't talk about getting you know, into powerlifting. If, if that's your thing, you overcame an eating disorder. I mean, you're going to get people that resonate with that. And that's your unique thing. So I, I yeah. feel like there's a lot of value in that, that people oh, neglect. I love that. You know, and we, I heard you use the term expert. Are you really an expert? And, and we get a lot of people that are suffering from this imposter syndrome around well, I don't feel like an expert until we can really have a conversation about what is it that brought you here? Let's talk about your story. What is your experience? Because you are an expert in this one thing, right? Whatever, whatever it is, you know, I mean, I might not be able, I'm not an expert in training someone for an endurance event. That is totally not my bag. I CrossFit because I don't like running. <laughs> I don't like, I'd rather lift, right? So that's my experience. But from the standpoint of where do, do I feel like an expert is, you know, working with moms that are around my age, in particular, working moms with children, trying to juggle a lot, but wanting to feel, not wanting to feel like you're run down and strung out and fat and not, not sexy and all this others, right? And so I've been there and I know what that feels like. And I'm an expert in kind of what that feels like. And I know how I got there and whether my path is going to work for you, I don't know but your path is going to work for you. And that's what I can do as a, as a health coach. That's what I'm an expert in. And so this, um, the, um, example that Aaron used, I just love it. You know, there was a term we used to use back in finance, which is fake it till you make it, which I wasn't sure how I felt about that. Um, as long as, and, and I guess I'm, I'm down with that. As long as in your mind, you're not faking it, so to speak, so much as living it, Right. If you want to be a successful health coach, you have to act like a successful health coach acts. You have to take the steps that a successful health coach does. And the same thing, by the way, goes through with your clients. When you're working with your clients and they want to be strong and lean and healthy and energetic, you've got to make the decisions that person makes, right? You have to take the actions that that person takes and you have to live as though you are that person. And eventually it comes to fruition. You know, I just love it. And authenticity is such a big one. When you first started, well, I guess, were you always that way? Or did you kind of feel like you had to 
come out and be something somebody else, what you thought somebody else wanted? Is this something you learned over time? Hmm. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I, I think a lot of people n- neglect the, the role of how your personality and identity can change over time in, in anything. So when I started, I was coming off, be, again, software engineer before that, I was an overweight World of Warcraft gamer. I mean, I wouldn't even hang out with myself right now if I was talking to 22-year-old Mario because we wouldn't have that much in common. So things change over time. But Mm -hmm. when I started my fitness journey, I started from a position of I'm walking the talk and I want to continue doing this to do this integrity. I think integrity at the end of the day is is super key. If I was 40 pounds overweight, if I wasn't staying between 10 and 15% body fat, working harder myself, being consistent, running a business at the same time, and then helping clients do the same thing. I mean, I would feel like an imposter. Like, what what am I actually doing here? So there's a lot of value in that. And I think it, the punchiness of the content is partially due to the fact that I know that I've been there. And I, as you mentioned, you, from my own experience, I can tell you where you are in your journey because I've been through the quote unquote hero's journey of the whole transformation. And then I can guide you through it myself. So I've been there before, but am I the person that started like that for you know, 30 years ago? No, like that no way, right? I developed myself over time. And I think that anybody at, at the end of the day, we have to come to terms that if you don't like where, where you are now, there's a possibility to change as long as you have a growth mindset and you can embrace new values. You can embrace things like self-care. You can embrace things like being strong. Those things were not my values before. When I was a World of Warcraft player, did I value self-care? No, I was just eating whatever, donuts and drinking <laughs> sodas and playing games. My value was to be the best at the game. Right. I didn't have a value of being a strong person physically and mentally. It was just not, not on my radar, but then I changed, I redefined my core values. Okay. What do I want to stand for? Not just who I feel like right now, but how do I want people to remember me? What's that person I want to be 10 years from now, 20 years, this is going in the direction that I would really be happy in my life. And then you start redefining some things and you come to certain realizations and then you say, okay, let's start embedding some of these habits. And of course, then habits, have that causal role of creating that new identity. As you go to the gym, you become a stronger person and you can embrace that value as well. So I do feel like actions can define identity, but also identity can define actions. So it's a really powerful, positive feedback loop when you can get get yourself in that. And then it becomes so easy to share that content out there. When you know you've just been to the gym and you hit it hard and you can do a quick live and share with your audience, hey guys, I didn't feel like it today. I went there. I didn't I understand you. You don't also don't feel like it, but here's what I did. Here's how I got my mind on my side. I think there's a tremendous amount of that psychological thing that, that is happening in this journey that people don't talk about. They're just doing the before and after photos, old physical stuff, but talking more about internal stuff. And I really try to do that a lot in my channel, talking about expectations, what battles I'm struggling with, because we're all, I mean, people the surface, they think, okay, everybody's perfect running business. You're making a lot of money. Everything's fine. Everybody has challenges every step of the way. Uh, I honestly think that business in in itself, you're just getting higher quality problems. Life in itself, you're just getting higher quality, more problems. Every single moment in time, you have a set of problems to solve. And I don't think that gets any easier, to be honest. You only, it gets harder and you just get better over time. So they just, the stakes are higher mm-hmm. and understanding that there's challenges that are going to keep coming up, not expecting that you're going to reach a point in your business where things are just going to get easier. Anytime I do a photo or video today, yeah, it's a little bit easier than I first started out, but it's still hard. I mean, it's always hard. Certain things are just hard mm-hmm. and you just kind of accept that, you know, dieting to 10% body fat is hard. Yeah. I mean, I can make it a little bit easier. Sure. But it's pretty damn hard. I hate being hungry. You know, it's just the way it is, but I'm not afraid to say that, that I'm yeah. hungry, that I, that I am struggling, that it's difficult for me as well, which I do feel like that value out there, that vulnerability and sharing, okay, I'm human. It just goes so far in, in your benefit compared to the general mainstream, I would say men's health, health type of world where it's all perfect. You know, it's a constantly being shredded all year round. And look, as a human, I can tell you right now, being shredded all year round is sucks miserable yeah. not just you but everybody around you so sharing that type of stuff so people understand the reality of the situation huge 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 value lots of content there i mean that can define you as a brand as a person really mm-hmm. that you're not the quote-unquote shredded guy i mean it helps right. like yeah. there are people out there feel the same 
Yeah. It's so like hearing you talk, your growth mindset is like palpable the way, the way you just kind of took us through all of that. And, um, I, I get a sense that you're, that you geek out on personal development. Um, maybe 22 year old world of Warcraft, Mario wouldn't have, <laughs> maybe, maybe that guy didn't have a growth or maybe he did have an inkling of a growth mindset or who knows. Right. Like, but it was cultivated. And what I love that you said there is like, you're not beholden to your values, whatever values you have today, your values can change as you oh, yeah. change your, your expression of authenticity isn't, it can change. You're not stuck with whatever authentic expression of values that you have right now that can be molded. It will change over time and just kind of hang on for the ride and be open to it. That's the growth mindset piece. That's so, so important. I love that. That was just a wonderful yeah. Um, monologue that you shared with us there. Yes. That Think about really what you're doing in coaching. You're, you're getting people to change their values. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or at least be honest and authentic to them. That's the big thing. Like I'll sit and have a conversation with a client and we're trying to get really deep on what that value really is. And then through gently conversation, pointing out how they're not living with integrity to those values. The choices that they're making are not in line with those values. So which is it? Are those really your values or are you just telling me, or that's, you know, you want me to think that those are your values and your values are really something else. Or is it that you don't feel, have the confidence, you don't feel you have the resources, you're not sure what to do to live in accordance with those values, which is really true. Um, because I do, and, and I, 100% agree with you that those values are going to change over time. Mine have, you know, I'm sure Aaron's has. And, and guess what? I have, my business has changed because the, as I've grown and matured and changed, my, the type of person that's drawn to me has as well. And my program has changed over time. So nothing is really written in stone. Just be authentic to who you are in the moment. And, and people are going to be drawn to that and your business will grow with it. So I just, I want to thank you for that whole monologue and, and how important that is, because I hope everyone found it as inspiring as I did just those last few minutes there. It's just awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I, I know a lot of coaches listening are going to want to hook up with you, learn more from you. So let's start, let's start wrangling up where people can find you. Yeah. We have a podcast that's a fitness entrepreneur uh, show. Uh, we can find it on fitnessentrepreneur.com. I think that's the best place to find more about my journey as an entrepreneur because there I share a lot of struggles, what I went through, sort of what my current business model looks like and what we do. So that's that's pretty cool. If you're interested in the stuff that I do on YouTube, sort of the client facing stuff, the content I put out to help my clients and create a legacy and all that cool stuff, easy to find with my name. You just type in Mario Fitness on YouTube, you'll easily find it. And, and that's really the two places that I would highly recommend just checking out just to see ultimately what that you know, how we, what we spoke today turns into something tangible and what that actually looks like from a business perspective. So yeah, they'll, they'll be awesome. two best places to check out. Love it. Very good. Awesome. awesome. This was so great. Thank you so much, Maria. I appreciate it. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening. Well, if you've been listening at Health Coach Radio, you'll know that we're all about raising the voices of practicing health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, but most importantly, helping to further legitimize this exploding industry. Erin and I have disclosed often that we're on the faculty of the Primal Health Coach Institute, founded by none other than the health and wellness legend, Mark Sisson. And we've interviewed dozens of guests from just about every different health coaching program you can think of, and who practice in just about any conceivable way you can think of. But our allegiance is to the health coaching industry in its totality, first and foremost. It's our desire to continuously and unapologetically lift and promote this industry that nudged us to create this podcast for you in the first place. 
It's this same yearning that encouraged us to take the educational offering at our health coaching school to the next level. We are so proud to offer the Primal Health Coach Level 2 certification course, which when combined with our primary course, the Primal Health Coach certification course, not only satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the board exam, but is specifically designed to teach advanced coaching mastery. You will work closely with a small class of peers through this 12-week, very intensive, live online classroom experience to learn how to execute a coaching relationship that is truly transformational. You'll learn and practice how to ask powerful questions, what it means to hold space for your clients, but most importantly, how to actually do it. You'll learn about the craft of motivational interviewing and the nuances of habit change goal setting, and accountability, and how to nurture your client's own inner knowing, their intuition, and their own self-efficacy so that they will graduate from your care a truly transformed person. You want a big, successful, powerful coaching practice. And maybe you're devouring our episodes looking for the silver bullet that's going to launch your business into the upper echelons. We've said it a million times and we'll say it again, your coaching skills are what will make or break you and set you apart for success in this field. So if you're looking to level up your coaching skills and maybe dial up your credential and become a board eligible health coach, look no further. You can learn more about PHCI's level two program at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash level two. But if you would value talking to a real person about your path to being a masterful coach and perhaps a board certified coach, Book some time with me personally. You can access my calendar at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or just call me. You can reach me at 844-307-7662. Thank you for listening to Health Coach Radio, and I hope I get to talk to you soon.